Hello, 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 and hello again. And as I promised, I know I've been tripping. I haven't been making as many videos as I should. I've got a ton of questions that people have been asking me for the last couple of years that I still haven't gotten to. This one is one of the top questions. So this week, I promise you, I'm going to get through the top questions. And this one is concerning energy. If this is your first time listening to me, you will see that I always try to get into the deeper science, but I want to keep it simple. But I love getting into the science of the why, because that's the type of person I am. You just can't tell me carbs, eat carbs, count calories. I want to know what is that? What is a calorie? What's a carb? Everybody's throwing out all these terms, but once you will... After you see this video, you'll see that most people don't have a clue what those things are. And in terms of energy, people asking me, you know, how come I don't have enough energy? It feels like I'm always tired. What can I do for more energy? My energy is low. I'm always fatigued. I don't feel like getting up in the morning. All of those type of things. And I know that most of us think energy has to do with coffee. Red Bulls or whatever. I don't like throwing out the business names because we can put them all in one big group. Different chemical drinks that give you that, that pelt, make your eyes open up. That's not energy. That's called drugs. <laughs> Caffeine is in the same family as any other stimulant. It stimulates. It's basically like taking a person with a rifle or a pistol it goes right up to your adrenal gland and says, make some adrenaline right now. And it starts pumping out adrenaline. And your eyes pop open. Oh, man, I need that. I need that coffee. You got coffee, rich caffeine. You got sugar in it, you know, which is another drug. And then you probably put in, you know, some type of milk product and stuff like that. A lot of people, I like mine black, okay? You're taking the, the pure drug, caffeine. Or, you know, I need to drink this drink before I go to work out. And when I'm saying this, I know the feeling. If you looked at any of my other videos, you'll see I used to drink a lot of those drinks when I had to do a lot of over-the-road driving. If I had to get off work, go from St. Louis to Chicago, visit my children, and come right back to St. Louis all within 24 hours, I was probably drinking a Kickstart, Red Bulls. Or um, the little milk ones that, um, what's the place called? Starbucks, the ones they make, those different shots that they have. You know, it's a different mocha flavored ones in the can. Back then it was in the bottle. I've had all of those things for so-called energy. But let's get into what energy really is and how the body is supposed to accept and create its own energy. Now, when I first started this, I said I like to get into science. If you already heard me before, I always talk about astronomy. Because even though we have all of these different sciences and different little sections, different little classes, different little subjects, they all are should be taught together. People who talk about health and don't go into the astronomy of where elements really come from, it feels like you're missing out. And that's why people don't have a clue. When they talk about calcium, oxygen, and things like that, where does it come from? They have no clue. Calcium does not come from a cow. I, I regress. Let me go backwards. Energy. Energy is used by your body to do some of everything. And the thing that you have to remember is energy for the human body takes place in your cells. Yes, you got to think about the microcosm. We're always thinking about out here. Oh, I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired. The cells themselves is where it's at. That's where energy things are made. The little factories in your cells that we're going to talk about. It's all happening inside the cells. Now, you need energy to make new cells, to move muscle, even for your brain to send signals throughout your body. 
It takes energy in order for things to move. So most of us know how cars work. Even if you're not a mechanic, even if you're not an engineer, you know if you don't put gas in your car, what's going to happen? You're going to be stuck somewhere. You're riding around on E, eventually your car is going to stop because you understand the basics. Even if you never had a shop class and don't know anything about the simple engines, two-stroke engines, you know that gas, when you put it in there, some of us know it has something to do with burning, little explosions and pushing pistons. Most people don't even know that. They just know that if I don't put this gas in this car, you know the car is going to stop working. That's basic knowledge. That's good. You know this. Your body is no different. Your body needs a biofuel. Bio meaning life. Fuel, you know, meaning that stuff you put in your car or any machine to keep it going. It must burn it. And there is an explosion. And we use that explosion to do work. And scientifically, work is not you feeling tired. Work is when you take something and you move it across a certain difference, uh, I mean, distance using a force. So some type of outside force, how much work was done is how far you move this object from point A to point B. If that object did not move, you did not scientifically and physically do any work. I want you to remember that. So sales do actual work using energy. Now, where do you get the energy from? Let's go into the molecules again. There is something called, there's different attractions that different molecules have that has to do with bonding, molecular bonding. That's the energy we actually are supposed to be using, and that's what we actually do use. You just don't know it. Chemical bond energy. That's when different molecules share electrons with each other. And that attraction holds that whole molecule in different compounds. When you have different molecules with different elements together, it's a compound. And they're held together with these electrons bonds. It holds it together. So if you can imagine setting some gas on fire gasoline and it getting an explosion and your engine being able to use that to push your car from A to B. Our bodies use that type of energy, but it's an electromagnetic explosion. If I guess we can call it that. I want you to think of explosions since you understand cars and gas. Molecular bonds, chemical bond energy from the foods we eat is that biofuel that we use. So now that you get that, you got that in your mind. There's a fuel that we have to use and we have to get that chemical bond energy because we don't just make it on our own. There are some life forms that do. Plants. We're going to get into that, but I'm going to start here because we want to talk about ourselves first. We have a very anthropomorphic way of looking at a very xenophobic way of looking at the universe. We're going to talk about the human first, even though you should learn from the plants first because they were made before you. But let's start. We're going to start with the human, the so-called animals and all of those things. We take in molecules from food. The broken down constituents of fats and sugars. Flies, a little mosca flying around here. That's what our body needs. That's that biofuel. You don't make that in your body. We have to get it outside of our body, which means you have to constantly eat and drink things in order to get the constituents, the biofuel that you need. We're going to talk about it later. Plants make their own. But I'm going to jump on that later. This is about we're going to start slowly with this. I want you to really get this. So I'm tired of seeing people thinking they know what energy is. I need energy. I need energy. I need energy. You're about to learn what energy is all about. So I just showed you. I used the analogy of the car and putting gas in your car, right? So you get there's some type of fuel that's used for the car. Your body's the same way. And it's deeper than this or oh, eating hamburgers and all these different things. Your body must break that stuff down to very, 
the most minute component of sugars and fats. It takes that, and I'm, and I'm talking about the different foods that you're supposed to be getting in you, have very, very, very high chemical bonds. Those would be the sugars and fats. If you took some sugar and burned it on a spoon, it will burn with a hot blue flame. And fat burns twice as much as that. I know you've been told I'm fat because I'm eating too much fat. It's deeper than that. That's not really true. You have to have fat. And if you watch any of my free videos where I pick different videos offline for you to watch, you will see Dr. McCullough was breaking it down for you that 95% of the stored energy in your body is in fat. That's, 90, that's a lot, 95%. But now you got this chemical bond energy that when you break apart that, that, that hold, uh, energy is released. We'll call it an explosion, an electromagnetic explosion that your body can use. And when your body breaks down those fats and sugars and breaks that hold, that, that uh, elect electronic chemical bond, energy is released in the form of electrons. There is an electron flow. That's electricity, people. There's an electron flow that's released. That's what we're using. So instead of an explosion from gas, this biofuel is broken down and we use the electrons from that, that electron energy. Now check this out. Because now we're going to get into something I keep trying to tell you about oxygen. A very, very, very important part of your being, of your constituency, is the main element in your body. And I know a lot of people say, well, water, we're mostly made of water, which is true. And water is H2O, two hydrogen atoms, one oxygen. And people are thinking, well, that means we're more hydrogen because it's two to one. But that oxygen molecule is this big and there's two small hydrogen atoms. So you're mostly oxygen. Keep that in mind. And you're about to see that I know what I was talking about when I tell you that you should be eating things that are very rich in oxygen content. Now, this particular point that we're at right now, we talked about you eating different foods, your body's breaking it down, and what's going on is as it's breaking it down, energy is released in the form of an electron flow. Now, let me take a step back. Where is this stuff happening at? In a factory. Every single cell in your body that has a nucleus, nucleated cells, have what is called mitochondria. The mitochondria, and you've seen it written mitochondrion, because there's actually two parts to it. It sort of looks like a uh, peanut. If you open that peanut up, you'll see it consists of two membranes. Most of your body is made of different types of skin. This is just a membrane. The outer shell it looks like a peanut. If you could take that apart and look inside of it, there's another shell in the inside, but it's folded up. Just like a lot of other parts of your body, like your brain, intestines, you know, to conserve space and also to give you a lot more surface area where you can do real work. We'll call that one, and not we'll call it, but it's called the um, inner membrane. It's the one that's all wrinkled up and everything that has the different folds in it, where you'll see a lot of the chemical reactions going on. The space in between that inner sac, that inner pod, that inner membrane, and the space between outside of that and the other pod, the other membrane on the outside, the outer membrane, there's a space in between that, the inner membrane space. That's where the food is being broken down, right inside that little factory. And you'll see in a second while I call it a factory, this, these are the little powerhouses where energy is produced. Well, the, uh, the, the, what, what is making like little batteries in your body. And we're going to get to that in a second. Just bear with me. I want to go a little slow. 
So, in this little space, inside these little pea pods, these little powerhouses, in that space right there is where the molecules are being broken down and energy is released as an electron flow. Now, I'm calling it electron flow because that's what it is. But I want you to think of electricity right now as water because you know what water is. You know what it looks like when water flows. So when you break apart these constituents of fats and sugars, this flow of water, which is really electrons, don't you think of water, is coming out. Now imagine that water coming out, turning different wheels. That's usually how they do it in class. You see these wheels turning as this water is flowing, which letting you know it's actually doing work. Now there's no little wheels and light bulb and stuff, but on, over each wheel, there's a, it's lighting up a light bulb. It's pushing the water's pushing the wheels. The wheels are turning the turbines, and electricity is produced and it's lighting up these bulbs. I want you to imagine that. That's what's happening when it's breaking down these foods fats and sugars, and this electron flow is coming out. Now we're going to get into the oxygen. What oxygen does, because it has a very, very, very strong affinity, it really loves electrons. Oxygen, that's why um, so-called free radicals, you're really talking about oxygen molecules going across your body and it's burning up everything because it's trying to attach to everything. It has a very, very strong affinity for electrons. So in the presence of oxygen, while those foods, fats, sugars are broken apart and that chemical bond energy is coming out, imagine that slope that I was showing you, that water bed that was sloped like this. What oxygen does, it makes the bed do that. Imagine water running down extremely fast now. Now those little wheels are turning right here a lot faster and the light bulbs on top of that are glowing a lot brighter. So now let's get back scientifically. What I'm saying is in the presence of oxygen, when the energy, the electrons are released from those chemical bonds, oxygen allows it to do more work. Now, there is no water, you know what I'm saying? But that's the best way for you to imagine what I'm talking about. That's how if you go take a class, that's how they explain it to the students. Because it makes sense. Because we get that. Water, we understand flowing water. And if you do like this and make the water flow down even faster because of gravity, the wheels are spinning a lot more and it can do more work. Oxygen allows this particular process to do more work. Now, what work is it doing? Now, we told you that was the space in between the two membranes. The inner membrane right here, the different folds and stuff, the edge of that on the outside is that other membrane, the outer membrane, that space in between, inner membrane space. Now you got that flow of electrons so it can do more work. Going back to this inner membrane, it is studded with things that look like little balloons. Usually when we see it in a picture, drawings of it. And I want you to think of a balloon because in, most of us at this age, and even if you're a little child, you've blown up a balloon before. If you like to do it or not, if you've done it one time in your life, you've blown up a balloon. And even if you haven't, it's always somebody up there blown a balloon. You've seen it being done. Somebody puts a balloon up to their mouth. <gasps> Take a big breath and they blow up this balloon. These pumps that are embedded in that inner membrane are little pumps of um, enzymes called ATP synthase. Synthase. What, what is ATP? This guy skipped over what ATP is. Well, that's why I'm telling it to you like this. I'm going to take a step back again. I want you to remember that, though. ATP synthase. 
you got as that food was being broken down, you not only have electrons, you have hydrogen ions. Hydrogen ions, what's he talking about? When you break up water, H2O, take the the O off, the oxygen off, oxygen um, element off of that, and you've got hydrogen just floating around. That hydrogen with and that presence of oxygen, it can shoot that oxygen from that inner membrane space into that inner membrane through those little studded pumps that I was just telling you about, ATP synthase. Now, anything that ends in ACE, that's an enzyme. Anything that ends in OSE is a sugar. We'll get into that later. Now, what is that doing? So I, I want you to imagine blowing a balloon. If it's no oxygen, blowing a little bit of hydrogen in there, and that hydrogen can escape that inner area, that space area, and get shot into that pump because what's energizing that pump, especially the more oxygen you have, is shooting hydrogen straight through to do work. What work is it doing? Glad you asked. Now we can talk about ATP. What is that? I want you to think of batteries. Why do I want you to do that? Because you know what a battery is. You know if your battery is drained, you put it in your Walkman. People are not even using Walkman anymore. You put it in your iPod or whatever. A lot of these things are even powered by, you know what I mean. You put battery, whatever you put batteries into, flashlight. If it's drained, the light goes dim. If they're rechargeable batteries, you can put them back on the charger. They charge back up. You put it back into that appliance. It's working again. Extremely bright until it's used down again. Get that? ATP is your body's main energy source. We're finally getting there. We're talking about energy. But what is ATP? It stands for adenosine triphosphate. Adenosine triphosphate. Just bear with me. There's this group. Sort of look like a little peanut again when you see it drawn. That's an adenosine molecule with three balls connected to it, which are each groups of phosphate. These are phosphate groups that are held together with what? Chemical bond energy. They're sharing electrons with each other. So they're holding these three balls of phosphate groups connected to this adenosine Adenosine tri, meaning three, phosphate. Adenosine with three phosphate groups attached to the end of it. Being held together by very, very strong chemical bonds because they're sharing electrons with each other and they're all connected together. So just like we took the energy from that food this battery and ATP flows around your cells, all throughout your cells, all day long. And what happens? That end phosphate can be torn off. And when that happens, it releases a lot of energy that your cells use. See, we're talking about energy now. This is the real energy. Your cells use mostly that energy from ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Once you take off one of those, how many is left? Two, right? Adenosine diphosphate. Di meaning two. Once you take off one of those phosphate groups, boom, an explosion. You can use that energy to do work and cells are using thousands of these transactions every single second all throughout the day. When you're awake, sleep, it doesn't matter. That's where your body, that's the number one source of energy that your body's using. See, I didn't talk about Red Bull, Kickstart, Starbucks coffee, whatever names you want to throw out there. Even the different foods we eat, you can name it paleo, vegan, raw. It doesn't really matter. 
Because when it all boils down, whatever you're eating, your body has to try to take the constituents of that, break it apart, use that electron flow, force in that hydrogen ion now. Now you're sort of following me now. I told you what ATP was. ADP is after that. End is taken off. Energy is released. How do you recharge that battery? You already know. That's the work that's being done with that hydrogen ion that's being blown through like a balloon. It's being forced through ATP synthase. Synthase, that ACE is letting you know an enzyme, right? When you synthesize something, you're making something. What are you making? Oh, it's called ATP synthase. You're making ATP again. So that's the energy that's being used. When you're forcing hydrogen ions in there, it can bombard a, another phosphate group and squeeze it on. That's where that's the, the best way I can think of it, you know, for us to really understand what's going on. That's what's being used to force on another phosphate group on top of adenosine diphosphate. And it once again, boom, you have adenosine triphosphate. Now, I know it took a while. I'm looking at the time, 26 minutes just to get to this part. But you have to understand this. You're getting what people take a whole semester to get. You're getting it right now. So please bear with me. Don't sign off just yet. Hopefully you're starting to get what's going on because we're going to go a little bit deeper. Hopefully you're following me now. Let's let's retract just a little bit to make sure you're caught up. What do we get energy from? The foods that we eat. We're eating foods hopefully with very high chemical bond energy. It gets released inside the mitochondria but in between that space right there and it's released in what type of energy? The form of electrons. And when there's oxygen present, it can do more work and force hydrogen ions. They can escape through those studded structures called that we'll call pumps that goes right into the inner membrane. That's ATP synthase that's studded all throughout that membrane, inner membrane, the work that's being done as that hydrogen ion is forced in there, that's being used to force free-flowing, you know, um, phosphate groups that are just flowing around, takes one of those and forces it back onto adenosine diphosphate to make ATP. So your body is constantly going from ATP to ADP constantly releasing energy boom the battery's getting recharged releasing energy works for Van Damme no matter what that work is and I'm gonna backtrack again what is most of the work that a lot of cells do something called active transport now I'm throwing out some of these terms because I want you to look like you know what you're talking about when somebody's talking to your gym oh my cars calories and stuff you can say slow down slow down I know what energy comes from, and you can use some of these terms to try to whoop them upside their head and let them know they need to go and check out Lorenzo's videos to really get what's going on when it comes to energy. So when somebody says, I'm just lacking energy, you need to go make some more ATP. That's what you need to do. You need to make some more mitochondria. Your body has, it even produces more mitochondria with different things we eat, different exercises. We'll talk about that too. And going back to Dr. McCullough, something I didn't know about. I got to do some research on this. But he says every single day we make our weight in mitochondria. I got to go check that out because that sounds amazing. Not saying it don't sound as far-fetched, but I was like, wow, that's crazy. Things you don't really think about. Let's go back again. So now you're caught up. Eating food is breaking down the constituents of fats and sugars, Right. Where is that happening at? In that little space between the two membranes. Electron energy. Oxygen makes it do more work. You can blow in more things, hydrogen ions, through those pumps, ATP synthase, and this recharging 
ADPs flowing around your cell and turn them back into ATPs. You're caught up. Now, since we're talking about that oxygen, I'm going to jump out and talk about bacteria. Only for one minute. We're not, we're not, it sounds like I'm going off on a tangent, but I'm not. Because I'm going to lead into something very, very important, talking about oxygen. Because oxygen comes into play right here at this step. When we're talking about breaking those food molecules down for that electron energy flow. Now, you do know, or maybe you know, maybe you don't, some bacteria, and for those that, you know, don't get it, bacteria was here before humans were here. That's why we're talking about this. I'm jumping there just because a lot of you might understand this. There are some bacteria that have adapted to where they can still survive even if there is no oxygen. Those same bacteria, when there's oxygen present, they're cool with that too. Now, me saying that, I'm going to jump back to our cells that we're talking about. See, that didn't take long. It wasn't even a whole minute. Your cells are exactly the same. Remember I said when it was breaking down that food, fats, sugars, and getting that electron energy and forcing in hydrogen ions through those pumps, ATP synthase, to do work. It can do it where there is no oxygen present. And when I say no oxygen, I'm talking about very little to no oxygen. So a cell is very important. This is going to be on the test if you're taking any of these biology classes. A cell, go look it up if you don't believe me, can metabolize sugar a sugar molecule and make, if there is no oxygen present, it can make two ATP. See, I had to say all the other stuff just to get up there. It's 32 minutes. I had to say all that because you don't even know what ATP is. Now you know what ATP is. You know what ADP and ATP is. Now that cell, one cell in your body, if there is no oxygen present, when it metabolizes a molecule of sugar, which now you know is some things you ate and it's broken down to the, the simple components of fats and sugars, and they break that bond and you get chemical energy, elect electronic energy. Now, one cell, when there's no oxygen, can metabolize one molecule of sugar and make two ADPs. So what am I about to say? Because I'm always telling you about oxygen. What can it do if there's oxygen present? That same cell making ATPs, metabolizing that same one molecule of sugar, when there's oxygen present, it can make 32. I'm sorry, is it 32 or 36? I don't want to give you the wrong. I believe it's 36 ATPs. I'm going to fact check that. Somebody fact check that for me. That's a big difference. Isn't it? From 2 to 32, I need to look that up. I don't want to give you the wrong number. Because that number is important if you ever take a class. But there's somebody out there right now. Hmm, it's really 34. It's 32. It's 32, 34, or 36. Sorry. I'm, it's been a while since I've taken these classes. But I still remember the gist of what's going on. But I want you to think about that. That amazes me because I always think back to the elements. Oxygen. Man, it is all about oxygen. When I found out that cancer cells cannot exist well in an oxygenated environment. What environment? We're talking about cells. When your cell, which is an aqueous, a water environment, when it's oxygenated, cancer does not thrive. I didn't say cancer that won't totally exist because everybody right now, if you have cancer or not, you've got one cell in your body right now at this moment. And if it's not right now, you're through cell death. Your body just took care of it. One cancer cell, at least one every single day. Your body's just when it's normally working like it's supposed to, it's going to take care of that. It's going to deal with it. So, 
We got people coming in. What's up, man? Hey. My son rolling through. So, in the presence of oxygen, it can make. Well, I'll go back and check it out. I'll probably put it in the notes. Excuse me for not knowing the exact number, but I believe it's like 36. 36 ATPs it can make from that same cell, the same molecule of sugar, but instead of two, it can make 36 or 34, 32, something like that. That's amazing. That's right now. I want you to take a second and think about the power of oxygen. The power of oxygen, when it was breaking down the food and sending that ATP in there, that's why I can do more work. Remember I told you about the affinity that it has for electrons? That's why it can do more work, making more ADP, ATPs. It's forcing more hydrogen in, and it can, like a hammer, put more phosphate groups on the end of that adenosine diphosphate. That's how that works. So now you're getting it. Now you're seeing that your body uses more than anything else ATP. Of course, when it's used, after it's done, it turns to ADP. And your body has to keep recharging that. And now you see how it's doing it. Now, backtrack again. We you made it to the end of the animal part or the so-called human part. I say animal and human because your pet dog work the same way. They have to do the same thing. Now, we're going to talk about the plant. Now, once again, I'll be t I'm, I have to keep reminding people, it's not about me trying to make vegetarians and raw fooders and stuff like that, but you really do need to understand why we eat food in the first place. Most people, most of your trainers probably never even talked about that. The reason why you have to eat food is because Plants are the only living things on this planet that can make their own biofuel. You've got to eat it by eating plants or animals that ate plants, which is why a lot of people who don't get when I tell you to make sure if you're going to still eat the meats, make sure that cow is grass fed, not eating other chopped up cows and pigs that died on the farm. It must be grass fed. The chicken should be eaten, even though they don't eat grass, I guess, you know, whatever seeds and stuff they're supposed to be eating. But you either have to eat the plant, which is the first source, the main source, or an animal that ate the plants. Why is that? Because they make their own biofuel. That same biofuel that you had to take in from eating food that was broken down into the components of the different uh, sugars, fats, where you get that electron energy from. Now that you get all of that, let's talk about what the plants do. The plants, let me, let me go backwards though. So what you just basically learned was we have to breathe in oxygen. We breathe in oxygen. We take in food molecules. We break that down. We make ATP. And the byproduct of that, which I didn't get into yet because the question, had, so we're going to get into that part. Where does the waste come from? Was you have to ask the question, where did all those different carbon molecules go from the food that I just ate? So a lot of you don't know, we didn't get that deep into it. Sugar, the six carbon, there's a benzene ring if you ever took chemistry and all that type of stuff. Where does that carbon go? It still has to go somewhere. And I want you to remember that when you eat something... When your body's working the way it's supposed to, the stuff that you ate should be getting used. And the stuff that you're not using anymore needs to get up out of you. And that's energy is also used to that. So if, you don't, if you're not making enough ATP, your body can't even extract waste the way that's supposed to. Remember that. That's going to be on your test for me. So those carbon atoms flowing around because you already broke it down to take out of it what you needed. You got the hydrogen being used to make more ATP when it's forced through the pumps, ATP synthase, right? You got these carbon atoms, you know what I'm saying, floating around. And what did I tell you has an affinity for pretty much everything, especially the electrons of other elements, oxygen, carbon. Then you got these O2, oxygen, 
O is oxygen. Two is the oxygen we usually breathe in. It gets coupled and makes CO2, carbon dioxide. That's what we breathe out. That's so oxygen in. We eat food, break that food down. We make ATP. That's our energy source. And then we breathe carbon dioxide out. I started with that. So you can now we can talk about the plant. The plant takes in the carbon dioxide. They breathe that. They use that. Not for mitochondria. They use it for chloroplasts. That's like their mitochondria for them. Now, we take a step back. The same way I just told you how we work, let's go into the plant kingdom. Remember I told you they make their own biofuel. That's really the main difference between plants and animals. That's the difference between our cells. They have a nucleus and everything just like we do. But they can make their own biofuel. For us, if there's no biofuel, where's the stuff going to be put into the mitochondria to do anything? Nothing's going to happen. But this is what happens to them. They have what are called chloroplasts. Chloroplasts, when scientists first used to look inside of a microscope and look at the leaf of a plant, they didn't know what these little boxes of these, not m and like, like green m and in it. You know what I'm saying? It looked like little green jelly beans or like little peas. They were like, that doesn't do anything. We don't know what that is. They didn't know what was going on until a lot later. But they were at least able to see it. And they were like, what's these little boxes of these green peas? What they were looking at were chloroplasts. And... If you open up a chloroplast, chloroplast, like I said, looks like a little jelly bean. When you open it up, inside of it are these pancake-looking structures. There are these discs that are hollow, stacked on type of them, stacked on top of themselves, inside the chloroplast. And there is a carpet, a green carpet, and I'm tell you why it's green. It's green because there's a carpet of um chlorophyll atoms. Now let's step back. Let's talk about these terms. What is chlorophyll? Chlorophyll is a very special substance on this planet. We call it green. Now let's go into the science of light for a second. When you see green plants, it's not really that it's green. It's reflecting the green spectrum of light. This shirt looks red to you or it might look it looks like it's orange when I'm looking at it on the screen but it's actually a red shirt it's just sort of dark in here and there's a I'm using inside lights for those that know how to do media you really don't want to use real inside lights it makes everything look a little yellow so this red shirt bright fire red engine shirt looks orange because of the light but the colors that you see from things are really the aspects or the frequencies of light reflecting off of it, that which was not absorbed. Remember that. So what we're calling red or orange, as it looks on this screen, I don't know how it's going to look after I you know, upload it, but let's call it orange since I'm looking at orange on the screen. Instead of this being really an orange shirt, the constituents of the dye in this shirt they're absorbing every single frequency of light in the light spectrum. Roy G. Bills, remember that? Roy G. Bills, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. They threw indigo in there. You know, they threw, it's really, but you know, to make it Roy G. Bills. That's a different story. But you've heard of Roy G. Bills. It's absorbing every single color except for the part between the red and the yellow that we call orange. It's reflecting that. Excuse me, I'm sorry. I was drinking some tea. Very, very strong tea and it's breaking up a lot of mucus and stuff. 
you didn't want to know that. But yes, that's the frequency. So going back to green, all plant life that we see is green, that we call green, is absorbing. Now let's go to those basic colors, red, green, and blue. Remember Roy G. Bill, red is way on this end of the spectrum. B, v, 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 the V, that's why that's what like uh, infrared, ultraviolet, you know, when you go into that um, the light spectrum, that part in the middle is that G, Roy G. Bill, right? Green. So it's absorbing all the frequencies of red, and it's also absorbing all the frequencies of light that are blue. And it's not even messing with the green. That's why chlorophyll looks green to us. So when we think of light, green is the color of life. Maybe it's red and blue. I want you to think about that for a second. But that's what chlorophyll does. It absorbs the red and blue frequencies of light and it reflects the green. That's why we see green when we see chlorophyll. Now, what is it doing with those frequencies of light? It has the ability in your chloroplast and those little pancakes stacks that I was talking about about or called phylicoids. Phylicoids are those stacks of discs that are hollow with a carpet of chlorophyll wrapped around it. Now, you're thinking about that. When a photon of light shines upon that leaf, the power of chlorophyll on those um, in that on those thylakoid stacks, it can absorb that photon and convert it into what? An electron. There we go again. But see, they're doing it without eating food, just by being outside in sunlight is converting light from the sun into energy. That fly just fly, fly across my camera like that. <laughs> that energy is converted to real electron energy. That's amazing. But that's something that plants can do that we can't. We just can't stand the sun and make electricity. And, and what we do, that'll go, that'll go into a different subject. But just remember that. Also what it does now. What does it do with that electron energy? Just like those pumps that I was telling you about. Now, remember that space in between the membranes? Now we're going to talk about that thylakoid space. The space in between all of those thylakoids, the stack of pancakes, green pancakes that I was telling you about. What is doing something similar that the mitochondria does. Is forcing, now this is what happens. We're still going to talk about hydrogen ions again, but this time it's coming from water, H2O. When that photon hits the chloroplast and that um, chlorophyll turns that light energy into an electron, that energy is then used to break the bonds between the hydrogen and oxygen in water. And now you're left with this hydrogen ion. Once again, we're left with that and it forces that into ATP synthase again. These little pumps and it does the same thing. It forces that through and the same thing is happening. ATP is being turned, I mean ADP it's getting turned into ATP. And what and what is it doing? Hold on, let me, let me go back a second again. Now we can talk about in this, we're gonna talk about there are some processes going on that while there's ADP being turned into ATP. There are some other things going on in this cycle 
that's called the Calvin cycle. Now, we don't, we don't want to get that deep into what's all going on. We, we got ADP going to ATP. You got NADH, NADP changing from different things. You got all these different chemical things. But to make it simple, basically, small structures of sugar are being created. These different linkages, these small links are getting longer and longer. So small linked molecules are becoming a little longer during this um, Krebs or this Calvin cycle. And some of that, um, there's something called PGAL. Now, what's the long term for it? Phosphorus, phosphoglycerol aldehyde, I believe it's called. We call it PGAL for short, P-G-A-L. This also made during this cycle that keeps happening over and over again. Some of that PGAL stays in that cycle to keep that cycle going. And then some of that PCAL gets put into an enzyme, and what comes out of that is glucose, a simple sugar, a six carbon sugar, glucose. And that one we're gonna say for when we start talking about carbs. People are oh, my carbs, my carbs, my carbs. We're gonna go into, and you see how long this is, just talking about how we get energy. So we're gonna say the carb thing. For another video that I'm going to do after this one. So this is what the plant is doing. Now, when I talk about the biofuel, I just told you it just made sugar, a simple sugar called glucose. And we get into carbs, you know, what are carbs, aldehyde or ketone elements with hydroxy groups, you know, uh, they could be glucose, Fructose, which is like from fruit, the most sweetest one. The lactose for milk, from milk. We're gonna get into all that. Two glucose is maltose. It's, it'll take it'll take us a whole another hour to jump into that, but I'm gonna make that one simple also. Right now, I just showed you that a plant can do something that you can't, which is why you gotta eat plants, or along with eating plants, eating different meats or animals. Eat plants. We don't go out and eat lion meat. <laughs> Lions themselves, because they cannot break down glucose, they have to eat animals that do that for them. See, anim the animals that are real meat eaters, they know why they're doing it. You just do it because it tastes good. They understand their part in the food chain. They have to eat. That's why the lions will go and just eat other lions and hyenas and stuff. They eat things that eat plants because they can't break down plants. So I um, have to put this in your mind so you don't just be eating everything. The reason why you can't eat animals if they were raised a certain way and clean without all the additives and different hormones and all this type of stuff. The reason why humans did that was because they ate the animals that were eating grasses. People can't eat grass. That's why uh, we start getting to why people are having problems with gluten and different things like that. We really weren't supposed to be eating seeds and grasses. And the seeds, like the different rices and stuff like that, actually come from the, their seeds for the grasses. We don't really digest that stuff very well. And if it is a part of your diet, it's supposed to be a very, very small con uh, constituent of your diet. But look at, look at where we are now. I showed you how ATP works in humans. But look at the symbiotic relationship. You've heard me talk about this before, but this is the first time I wanted to make a video where you can really get, I wanted to get into the science part. A lot of people don't care about this stuff. But those who do, now you understand. When we breathe out carbon dioxide, the plant takes in that oxygen. I mean, I'm sorry, that carbon dioxide. And for it, the byproduct, which we didn't get that deep into, its waste product is oxygen. That's what's left over after they're finished with that cycle. After their cycle, when they're making pea gal and stuff like that, they're making simple sugars that will later be starches and things like that. They're making sugars and or starches, which is a biofuel that they're going to use themselves. And now you get, though, how they can use, you know, mitochondria. So 
they can feed the mitochondria now because they took in sunlight, they made it into energy, and through their own processes, they made a biofuel, glucose, which is used to build our cells and which is used to make cellulose, which is the sugar that makes up the cells of plants. They make it on their own without having to eat another plant or eating human things like that. But we live symbiotically together in a relationship where they need the carbon dioxide that we breathe out. So the mitochondria, now when I say me, let's go back deeper on the inter, intercellular, how about the intercellular, but an intercellular language lingo, it's our mitochondria giving off carbon dioxide. The chloroplasts need that so it can do what it does. And then its byproduct and its waste product is oxygen. So the chloroplast, the chloroplasts feed the mitochondria. The mitochondria feed the chloroplasts. They can do it all inside their own body, but we have to eat the plant in order to feed our mitochondria. It's just they can do it all in-house, if you will. And I'm going to end it right there because I think now you're getting, you're getting that. So that same biofuel, now let's go back to what I said. Now the plants aren't really making fats. You know, we can think about fatty acids that are in certain oils from different plants and stuff like that. But in terms of... Um, the basic constituencies, you can get those things from plants, flaxseed oil, different oils and things like that. You can get all your fats, and then the different sugars, the simple sugars, monosaccharides that you get from plants. Those are the basic things that you need, and that's where your energy is coming from. We finally got there. That's how humans get energy. I try to make it as fast as I could, but look at all you've learned. You know what ADP and ATP is now? And uh, what I call the Calvin cycle, the Kreft cycle, you know, I might get those mixed up. You know, you, you understand the different cycles that, that plants make, that we, the different cycles that plants use to make different foods, the glucose, PCAL, which is a precursor for that, for glucose, and also keeping that cycle going from making these small chain molecules into longer chain molecules. And we're going to get into that a little bit later about what does that mean? When we start talking about the different sugars, monosaccharides, disaccharides, poly, oly, oligosaccharides, and all that type of stuff like that. But now, hopefully you get, when people are talking about energy, you know it's deeper than going to get that drink to get yourself some energy. You know it's different than, you know, some type of food that's going to wake you up and stuff like that because it takes a long time you to get energy from what you ate. So when you think you're getting up for a break fast, eating this big thing with pancakes, eggs, and sausage, and all that type of stuff, your body will not release any energy and make any ATPs or make it either other mitochondria from that for hours. You just think you're getting energy because you put so much sugar into it, you're getting a quick high from the caffeine and quick sugars fake sugar and stuff. You're getting this little spike in so-called energy, which really is adrenaline for a lot of people. And that's why you crash when it's time for lunch. Hopefully you got that. This has been a video I've been wanting to do because a lot of people have been asking me. And when I explain to people over and over again, they're still like, hmm, what are you talking about ATP? What? Is that like FTP? No. Hopefully now you get how humans and animals make energy, and hopefully you get how plants make their own, okay? And I'll put in the notes the correct amount of ATPs made, and I'll put in the notes, you know, is this Krebs cycle or the Calvin cycle, you know, because it's been a while for me too, but I still remember the gist of what's going on with this type of stuff. Once again, it's been Professor Lorenzo McCoy. See you later. Peace.